Good evening. I am Boston University Provost David Campbell, and on behalf of all of us here at Boston University, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 2007 University Lecture. I have two tasks. One is straightforward but important. Please silence your cell phones if you haven't already. And the second is to give you a little bit of history uh, about the University Lecture and to introduce uh, Bob Brown, our president, who will introduce the speaker. Established in 1950, the University Lecture provides an opportunity for all of us to learn from a distinguished member of Boston University's faculty who is actively engaged in research or scholarship. It is a forum open to all, students, faculty, and staff at the university, as well as our neighbors in the greater Boston area. And I am delighted by the excellent attendance we see here tonight. It involves in the consideration of issues that are important to all of us in our understanding of the world. Over the decades, these lectures have galvanized discussion, provoked inquiry, educated and informed us about topics as diverse as language acquisition, presidential disability, genomics, the atmosphere of distant planets, and the heritage of Scottish kings, a particular favorite of mine. Despite the continuing trend toward interdisciplinary research and collaboration, it remains rare, even in academia, to hear a lecture from someone with an expertise entirely different from our own. The beauty of the university lecture is that all of us, humanists, scientists, engineers, medical practitioners, and others come together to learn, be inspired, and open our eyes to a wider world. As a physicist and engineer, I am greatly looking forward to this evening's presentation by a most distinguished expert in international relations. And so I am very pleased to ask Bob Brown, Boston University's 10th president, to introduce tonight's lecture and his topic. Bob. Thank you, David. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you tonight to our annual university lecture. As David said, the university lecture does not merely honor a single person. It is a chance to hear directly from a highly accomplished scholar who is engaged in work on a topic of issue of great importance, a point appreciated by the large audience that has gathered here this evening. But tonight's lecture is much more than this. As you know, hundreds of lectures take place at Boston University every day in classrooms and halls throughout our campus, delivered by members of our faculty, visiting scholars, and public figures. Tonight is a singular event, however, because of the rigorous process for selecting this speaker, because of the topic chosen by the speaker, the work put into preparing the lecture, and not least because of the history behind this series. The university lecture is, in every way, a celebration of our intellectual life at the university. We are very proud tonight to present Dr. Andrew J. Basevich, a professor of history and international relations, whose lecture is entitled, Illusions of Managing History, the Enduring Relevance of Reinhold Niebuhr. Professor Basevich has been a member of our faculty since 1998. A graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, he earned a, his Ph.D. at Johns Hopkins University in American Diplomatic History. He is the author of several books, including The New American Militarism, How Americans Are Seduced by War in 2005, and American Empire, The Realities and Consequences of U.S. Diplomacy in 2002. He also has edited, edited numerous books and his essays, reviews, and op-ed articles have appeared in many newspapers and other publications, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, the International Herald Tribune, the New Republic, the Atlantic Monthly, and Foreign Affairs, among many more. Please welcome Dr. Andrew Basevich. Thank you to President Brown and to Provost Campbell for this uh, high honor. And I thank my colleagues and friends for uh, joining us this evening. It's very gratifying for me to have a chance to, to talk to you. I think I see some of my students here, and I'm grateful that they've come. For those in my undergraduate foreign policy course, if you think you get a bonus point for showing up, <clears throat> you're wrong. 
My note here says, don't get weepy. But I want to thank my family. Some of you may know we've been going through a difficult time. My beloved wife and my two beautiful daughters who are here have been just pillars of strength. And I don't know what I would have done without their support. I should hasten to add that our third daughter, who is not here, is also beautiful. <laughs> I'm not uh, generally very comfortable giving formal lectures. I, I, I give a lot of presentations. I tend to call them talks because I speak from uh, notes, try to be brief, let the audience pontificate. But I know that this is a more formal occasion, and you can see that I've worn my good suit. So I'm going to try to stick to my prepared text. But before I begin the prepared text, I thought that it might be useful for me to make a brief explanation for how I came to choose this particular topic about Reinhold Niebuhr. I am not a Niebuhr scholar. And I'm sure there are some theologians or intellectual historians lurking out there in the audience who want to give me my comeuppance before the evening is over, and I'll simply concede in advance that you're right. <laughs> I'm more of a Niebuhr groupie. As I think is roughly 10 years ago, at a yard sale, I picked up a used copy of Niebuhr's book, The Irony of American History. I think I bought it for a dime. <clears throat> the book came out in 1952. It, it was inscribed. It was a gift to a, a young man from his parents on the occasion of his graduation from high school. That's what they were given back in 1952 for graduation <laughs> gifts. But I brought the book home, and I uh, read it, and uh, rather quickly, concluded that as far as I was concerned and what I had been reading, that this book, this short, it's a very short book, was the most, provided the most profound analysis of U.S. foreign policy I'd ever encountered. And 10 years later, I still think that's the case. When, when we moved up here in 1998 and I began to teach at Boston University, one of the courses that I introduced is called Ideas in American Foreign Policy, and I used irony as one of the course texts. And in requiring my students in that course to read it from one year to the next, of course, I kept going back to the text from one year to the next. And as I did so, my appreciation for Niebuhr just continued to grow. So when Provost Campbell sent me a letter a couple months ago and invited me to give this lecture, even though I had never really written anything of any length about Niebuhr. It seemed to me that this lecture really offered the made-to-order opportunity for, to meet, for me to provide my own assessment of Reinhold Niebuhr and to make a statement about why I think Reinhold Niebuhr is today such an important figure. So this lecture is that statement. Many of you, I know, are familiar with the broad outlines of Reinhold Niebuhr's life and work. A pastor, teacher, activist, moral theologian, and prolific author, Niebuhr was a towering presence in American intellectual life from the 1930s through the 1960s. He was, at various points in his career, a Christian socialist, a pacifist, an advocate of U.S. intervention in World War II, a staunch anti-communist, an architect of Cold War liberalism, and a sharp critic of the Vietnam War. For contemporary Americans inclined to believe that history began anew on September 11, 2001, the controversies that engaged Niebuhr's attention during his long career appear not only distant, but also permanently settled and therefore largely irrelevant to the present day. So, too, Niebuhr's own writings have seemingly lost their salience. 
When the historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who knew Niebuhr well and admired him greatly, published an essay in 2005 lamenting that his friend had vanished from public consciousness, he may have overstated the case, but only slightly. Today, Niebuhr's major works, among them Moral Man and Immoral Society, The Children of Light and the Children of Darkness, and The Irony of American History, are either out of print or go unread. Except among academic specialists, Niebuhr is a largely forgotten figure. My very modest purpose this evening is to promote a Niebuhrian revival. The times call for it. The predicaments in which the United States finds itself enmeshed today, particularly in the realm of foreign policy, demand it. Let me make the case more directly. To read Niebuhr today is to avail oneself to a prophetic voice, speaking from the past about the past, but offering truths of enormous relevance to the present. As prophet, Niebuhr warned that what he called our dreams of managing history, dreams born out of a peculiar combination of arrogance, hypocrisy, and self-delusion, posed a large and potentially mortal threat to the United States. Today, we ignore that warning at our peril. Since the end of the Cold War, the management of history has emerged as the all but explicitly stated purpose of American statecraft. In Washington, politicians speak knowingly about history's clearly discerned purpose and about the responsibility of the United States at the zenith of its power to guide history to its intended destination. None have advanced this proposition with greater fervor and on occasion with greater eloquence than George W. Bush. Here is the president in January 2005 at his second inaugural alluding to the challenges posed by Iraq while defending his decision to invade that country. Because we have acted in the great liberating tradition of this nation, tens of millions have achieved their freedom. And as hope kindles hope, millions more will find it. By our efforts, we have lit a fire as well, a fire in the minds of men. It warms those who feel its power. It burns those who fight its progress. And one day this untamed fire of freedom will reach the darkest corners of our world. Now, especially coming from this president, the temptation to dismiss such remarks as so much hot air is strong. Yet to give in to that temptation is to err. By itself, cynicism provides an imperfect tool for explaining the behavior of the United States or the motives of its leaders. Better to view the passage as authentically American, President Bush expressing sentiments that could just as well have come from the lips of Thomas Jefferson or Abraham Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson or Franklin Roosevelt, John Kennedy or Ronald Reagan. In remarkably few words, the president affirms a narrative to which the majority of our fellow citizens subscribe while also staking out for the United States claims that most of them endorse. This narrative renders the past in ways that purport to reveal the future. Its defining features are simplicity, clarity, and conviction. The story it tells unfolds along predetermined lines, leaving no room for doubt or ambiguity. History, the president goes on to explain, has a visible direction set by liberty and the author of liberty. Furthermore, at least by implication, the author of liberty has specifically anointed the United States as the agent of liberty. Thus assured, and proclaiming that America's vital interests and our deepest beliefs are now one, the president declares that, quote, we go forward with complete confidence in the eventual triumph of freedom. Now, as a student of history, I find President Bush's depiction of the past to be sanitized, selective, and self-serving were not simply false. The great liberating tradition to which he refers is, to a considerable extent, poppycock. As someone who is by temperament a conservative, I recoil from his his quasi-demagogic incantations. 
the president celebrates freedom without defining it. And he dodges any serious engagement with the social, cultural, and moral incongruities arising th from the pursuit of actually existing freedom. As a believer for whom God remains dauntingly inscrutable, I view the president's confident explication of the creator's purpose to be at the very least presumptuous, if not altogether blasphemous. Still, I am obliged to acknowledge that in his second inaugural address, as in other presentations he has made, President Bush succeeds quite masterfully in capturing something essential about the way that Americans see themselves and their country. Here is a case where myths and delusions combine to yield perverse yet important truths. Reinhold Niebuhr helps us appreciate the large hazards embedded in these myths and delusions. From what perspective does Niebuhr speak to us? We live in a time in which the urge to label people is strong. Yet Niebuhr defies easy categorization. Throughout his life, he viewed himself as a man of the left. Yet to classify him as a liberal, or to employ a term currently in fashion as a progressive, is to sell him short. As with any true prophet, Niebuhr belongs to no particular camp. Truth tellers transcend partisan affiliation. Prophecy is not a calling for the meek. It requires persistence, tough-mindedness, and a commitment to principle. The prophet tells people not what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. He or she does not pander or spin or sugarcoat. The prophet is not for sale and does not spend wakeful nights plotting his next career move. In short, a prophet is everything that the typical talking head or office seeker of our own day is not. As a prophet, Niebuhr thought deeply about the dilemmas confronting the United States as a consequence of its emergence as a global superpower. The truths he spoke are uncomfortable ones. They do not easily translate into sound bites suitable for the Sunday morning talk shows, nor do they offer material from which to weave the sort of stump speech likely to boost the poll numbers of your favorite candidate in Iowa or New Hampshire. Four such truths merit particular attention at present. They are the persistent sin of American exceptionalism, the indecipherability of history, the false allure of simple solutions, and finally, the imperative of appreciating the limits of power. Let us examine each in turn. <clears throat> One persistent theme of Niebuhr's writings on foreign policy concerns the difficulty that Americans have in seeing themselves as they really are. Perhaps the most significant moral characteristic of a nation our prophet declared in 1932, is its hypocrisy. Niebuhr did not exempt his own nation from that judgment. The chief distinguishing feature of American hypocrisy lies in the conviction that America's very founding was a providential act, both an expression of divine favor and a summons to serve as God's chosen instrument. The Anglo-American colonists settling these shores, writes Niebuhr, saw it as America's purpose, quote, to make a new beginning in a corrupt world. They believed, quote, that we had been called out by God to create a new humanity. They believed further, as it seems likely that George W. Bush believes today, that this covenant with God marked America as a new Israel. As a chosen people possessing what Niebuhr referred to as a messianic consciousness, Americans came to see themselves as set apart, their motives irreproachable, their actions not to be judged by standards applied to others. Every nation has its own form of spiritual pride, Niebuhr observed in the irony of American history. Our version is that our nation turned its back upon the vices of Europe and made a new beginning. Even after World War II, he wrote, the United States remained, quote, an adolescent nation with illusions of childlike innocency. 
Indeed, the outcome of World War II, vaulting the United States to the apex of world power, seemed to affirm that the nation enjoyed God's favor and was doing God's work. Such illusions have proven remarkably durable. We see them in the way that President Bush, certain of the purity of US intentions in Iraq, shrugs off responsibility for the calamitous consequences ensuing from his decision to invade that country. We see them also in the way that the administration insists that Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo or the policy of secret rendition that delivers suspected terrorists into the hands of torturers in no way compromises U.S. claims of support for human rights and the rule of law. It follows that only cynics or scoundrels would dare suggest that more sordid considerations might have influenced the American choice for war or that incidents like Abu Ghraib signify something other than simply misconduct by a handful of aberrant soldiers. As Niebuhr wrote, when we swathe ourselves in self-regard, it's but a short step to, to concluding that, quote, only malice could prompt criticism of any of our actions. An insight that goes far to explain the outrage expressed by senior US officials back in 2003 when old Europe declined to endorse the war. In Niebuhr's view, America's rise to power derived less from divine favor than from good fortune, combined with a fierce determination to convert that good fortune into wealth and power. The good fortune, Niebuhr referred to it as America rocking in the cradle of its continental security, came in the form of a vast landscape rich in resources, ripe for exploitation, and insulated from the bloody cockpit of power politics. The determination found expression in a strategy of commercial and territorial expansionism that proved staggeringly successful. Evidence not of superior virtue, but of shrewdness, punctuated with a considerable capacity for ruthlessness. In describing America's rise to power, Niebuhr did not shrink from using words like hegemony and imperialism. His point is not to tag the United States with responsibility for all the world's evils. Rather, it is to suggest that we do not differ from other great powers as much as we imagine. On precisely this point, he cites John Adams with considerable effect. Power, observed Adams, always thinks it has a great soul and vast views beyond the comprehension of the weak and that it is doing God's service when it is violating all of God's laws. Niebuhr had little patience for those who portray the United States as acting on God's behalf. In that regard, the religiosity that seemingly forms such a durable element of the American national identity has a problematic dimension. Quoting Niebuhr again, all men are naturally inclined to obscure the morally ambiguous element in their political cause by investing it with religious sanctity, he wrote. This is why religion is more frequently a source of confusion than of light in the political realm. In the United States, he went on to say, the tendency to equate our political with our Christian convictions causes politics to generate idolatry. The emergence of evangelical conservatism as a force in American politics, which Niebuhr did not live to see, has only reinforced this tendency. Niebuhr anticipated that the American veneration of liberty could itself degenerate into a form of idolatry. In the midst of World War II, he went so far as to describe the worship of democracy as, quote, a less vicious version of the Nazi creed. He cautioned that, quote, no society, not even a democratic one, is great enough or good enough to make itself the final end of human existence, end of quote. Our prophet's skepticism on this point does not imply that he was anti-democratic. However, Niebuhr invented an instinctive aversion to anything that smacked of utopianism. And he saw in the American creed a susceptibility to the utopian temptation. 
In the early phases of the Cold War, he provocatively suggested that, quote, the evils against which, which we contend are frequently the fruits of illusions which are similar to our own. Although Niebuhr was referring here to the evils of communism, his comment applies equally to the present, when the United States contends against the evils of violent Islamic radicalism. The illusions of Osama bin Laden find their parallel in the illusions of George W. Bush. Each of these two protagonists is intent on radically changing the Middle East. The former by ejecting the West and imposing Sharia, the latter by defeating the terrorists and imprinting modernity. Neither will succeed, although in the meantime, they engage in a de facto collaboration that does enormous mischief. A perfect illustration of what Niebuhr once referred to as, quote, the hidden kinship between the vices of even the most vicious and the virtues of even the most upright. Niebuhr cherished democracy, but he saw it as what he called a method of finding proximate solutions for insoluble problems. Its purpose, he thought, is as much to constrain as to, liber as to liberate. Man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, he wrote, but man's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. For Niebuhr, the tendency to sanctify American political values and by extension US policy was anathema. Tossing aside what he calls the garnish of sentiment and idealism or the halo of moral sanctity, he summons us today to disenthrall ourselves from the self-aggrandizing parable to which President Bush refers when he alludes to America's great liberating tradition. To purport that this tradition either explains or justifies the US presence in Iraq is to engage in self-deception. Although politics may not be exclusively or entirely a quest for power, Considerations of power are never absent from politics. Niebuhr understood that. Borrowing a phrase from John Dewey, he reminds us that, quote, entrenched predatory self-interest shapes the behavior of states. Even if unwilling to acknowledge that this axiom applies in full to the United States, Americans might, as a first step, achieve what Niebuhr referred to as, quote, the honesty of knowing that we are not honest, end of quote. Why is this so important? Because self-awareness is an essential precondition to Americans acquiring a more mature appreciation of history generally. On this point, Niebuhr is scathing and relentless. Those who pretend to understand history's direction and ultimate destination are, in his view, charlatans or worse. Unfortunately, the times in which we live provide a plethora of opportunities for frauds and phonies to peddle such wares. Despite an abundance of evidence to the contrary, modern man, Niebuhr writes, clings to the view that, quote, history is the record of progressive triumph of good over evil. In that regard, President Bush certainly fits the definition of a modern man. So too, do, do, so too do those who announce that with history having ended, plausible alternatives to democratic capitalism cannot exist. Who declare categorically that globalization will determine the future of the international system. Or who prattle on about America's supposed indispensability as the sole remaining superpower. All of these deep thinkers fall prey to what Niebuhr described as, quote, the inclination of wise men to imagine that their wisdom has exhausted the infinite possibility of God's power and wisdom. The limits of their own imagination define the putative limits of what lies ahead, a perspective that, as we learned on September 11, 2001, only serves to set the observer up for a nasty surprise. 
In Niebuhr's view, although history may be purposeful, it is also opaque. A drama in which both the storyline and the denouement remain hidden from view. The twists and turns that the plot has already taken suggest the need for a certain modesty in forecasting what is to come. Yet, as Niebuhr writes, modern man lacks the humility to accept the fact that the whole drama of history is enacted in a frame of meaning too large for human comprehension or management. Such humility is in particularly short supply in present-day Washington. There, especially among neoconservatives and neoliberals, the conviction persists that Americans are called upon to serve, in Niebuhr's most memorable phrase, as tutors of mankind in its pilgrimage to perfection. For the past six years, Americans have been engaged in one such tutorial. After 9-11, the Bush administration announced its intention to bring freedom and democracy to the people of the Islamic world. Ideologues within the Bush administration, egged on by pundits and policy analysts, persuaded themselves that American power, employed adroitly, could transform the greater Middle East, with the invasion of Iraq intended to jumpstart that process. The results speak for themselves. Indeed, events have now progressed far enough to permit us to say, with Niebuhr, that in Iraq, the paths of progress have turned out to be more devious and unpredictable than the putative managers of history could understand. The collapse of the Bush administration's hubristic strategy for the Middle East would not have surprised our prophet. Nearly 50 years ago, he cautioned that, quote, even the most powerful nations cannot master their own destiny. Like it or not, even great powers are subject to vast forces beyond their ability to control or even to understand, quote, caught in a web of history in which many desires, hopes, wills, and ambitions other than our own are operative, end quote. The masterminds who conceived the Iraq War imagined they could sweep away the old order and usher into existence a new Iraq, expected to be liberal, democratic, and aligned with the United States. Their exertions have only demonstrated, in Niebuhr's words, that, quote, the recalcitrant forces in the historical drama have a power and persistence beyond our reckoning. Now, the first of our four truths, the persistent sin of American exceptionalism, intersects with the second, the indecipherability of history, to produce the third, namely the false allure of simple solutions. Nations possessed of outsized confidence in their own military prowess are notably susceptible to the apparent prospect of simple solutions, as the examples of Germany in 1914, Japan in 1937, and the Soviet Union in 1979 suggest. Yet Americans, patients never their long suit, are by no means immune to such temptations. What Niebuhr wrote back in 1958 remains true today. The American nation has become strangely enamored with military might. In the aftermath of 9-11, administration enamored with military might insisted on the necessity of using force to eliminate the putative threat represented by Saddam Hussein. To a loud and jingoistic chorus, Saddam's existence had become intolerable. The danger that he posed was growing day by day. A showdown had become unavoidable. To delay further was to place at risk the nation's very survival. Besides, as one Washington insider famously predicted, a war with Iraq was sure to be a cakewalk. These were the arguments mustered in 2002 and 2003 to persuade Americans and the rest of the world that preventive war had become necessary, justifiable, and even inviting. A half century earlier, Reinhold Niebuhr had encountered similar arguments. The frustrations of the early Cold War, combined with the knowledge of US nuclear superiority uh, to produce calls for preventive war against the Soviet Union. 
In one fell swoop, advocates of attacking Russia argued the United States could eliminate its rival and achieve permanent peace and security. Niebuhr regarded this line of reasoning with horror. The idea of a preventive war, he wrote, sometimes tempts minds whose primary preoccupation is the military defense of a nation and who think it might be prudent to pick the most propitious moment for the start of what they regard as inevitable hostilities. But the rest of us, he continued, must resist such ideas with every moral resource. In Niebuhr's judgment, the concept of preventive war fails both normatively and pragmatically. It is not only morally wrong, it is also stupid. Nothing in history is inevitable, he observed, including the probable. So long as a war has not broken out, we still have the possibility of avoiding it. Those who think that there is little difference between a cold war and a hot war are either knaves or fools. Well, throughout the second half of the 20th century, such cautionary views shared by American presidents helped avoid a nuclear conflagration. Between 2002 and 2003, however, they did not suffice to carry the day. The knaves and fools got their war, which has yielded not the neat and tidy outcome promised, but a host of new complications. Yet even that has not dissuaded those still committed to the proposition that military power offers simple solutions to otherwise daunting problems, keen to dispose of the difficulties we have brought upon ourselves in Iraq, they are now calling for an even wider application of the Bush doctrine with Iran as the next target. Now, as a practical matter, the Bush administration is unlikely to heed this advice, if only because it already finds itself saddled with too much war for too few soldiers. Even so, the president has shown no inclination to reconsider his endorsement of preventive war. The Bush doctrine remains on the books, and the Congress has not insisted upon its abrogation. Given what the implementation of this doctrine has produced in Iraq, Niebuhr would certainly have viewed its survival as both remarkable and deeply troubling. Finally, there is the imperative of appreciating the limits of power. For Niebuhr, the very foundation of sound statecraft. In reading and rereading many of Niebuhr's works in preparing for this lecture, the most disconcerting passage I came across was this one, written in 1937. One of the most pathetic aspects of human history is that every civilization expresses itself most pretentiously, compounds its partial and universal values most convincingly, and claims immortality for its finite existence at the very moment when the decay which leads to death has begun. Well, we Americans certainly live in a time when our political leaders have made pretentious proclamations something of a specialty, despite mounting evidence of decay, apparent everywhere from the national debt, now approaching $9 trillion, the trade imbalance, surpassing $800 billion last year, and the level of oil imports exceeding 60% of our daily requirements. A large gap is opening up between the professed aspirations of our political class and the means available to fulfill those aspirations. Each of the last four presidential administrations has relied on military might to conceal or to minimize the significance of this gap. Unfortunately, with the Iraq war now having demonstrated that US military power has very real limits, our claim of possessing the greatest military the world has ever seen no longer carries quite the clout it once did. To the end of history, Niebuhr predicted, social orders will probably destroy themselves in the effort to prove that they are indestructible. 
so it may be with the United States, which today finds itself in a position akin to that of the aging and flabby heavyweight champ who was seriously in hock to the IRS, yet can see no alternative but to climb back into the ring. The champ needs to clean up his act and devote himself to new pursuits. Niebuhr would likely counsel the United States to follow a similar course. The greater danger, he worried a half century ago, is that we will rely too much on military strength in general and neglect all the other political, economic, and moral factors that constitute what he called the wellsprings of unity, health, and strength. The time to confront this neglect is at hand. We do so by giving up our messianic dreams and ceasing our efforts to coerce history in a particular direction. This does not imply a policy of isolationism. It does imply attending less to the world outside of our borders and more to the circumstances within. It means ratcheting down our expectations. Americans, what need, Americans need what Niebuhr described as, quote, a sense of modesty about the virtue, wisdom, and power available to us for the resolution of history's perplexities. Even today, after four and a half years of flailing about in Iraq, President Bush still talks about bringing democracy to that benighted land as if simply trying harder will do the trick. Yet as Niebuhr correctly observed, even the wisest statecraft cannot create social tissue. It can cut, sew, and redesign social fabric to a limited degree. But the social fabric upon which it works must be given. In Iraq, to the extent that any meaningful social fabric ever existed, events have now torn it beyond repair, however long the United States may persist in this misadventure. Rather than engaging in vain attempts to remake places like Iraq in our own image, the United States would be better served if it focused on creating a stable global order, preferably one that avoids the chronic barbarism that characterized the 20th century. During the run-up to the Iraq War, senior members of the Bush administration and their neoconservative supporters repeatedly expressed their disdain for mere stability. Since March of 2003, they have acquired a renewed appreciation for its benefits. The education has come at considerable cost. Over 3,800 American lives and several hundred billion dollars so far. Niebuhr did not disdain stability. Given the competitive nature of politics and both the improbability and undesirability of any single nation achieving genuine global dominion, he posited what he called a tentative equilibrium of power as the proper goal of US policy. Among other things, he wrote, nurturing that equilibrium might afford the United States with, quote, an opportunity to make our wealth sufferable to our conscience and tolerable to our friends. Yet efforts to establish such an equilibrium by fiat would surely fail. Creating and maintaining a balance of, of power requires finesse and flexibility. Locating what Niebuhr called the point of concurrence between the parochial and the general interest, between the national and the international common good. This, in a nutshell, wrote Niebuhr, comprises the art of statecraft. Now, during the Cold War, within the Western camp at least, the United States enjoyed considerable success in identifying this point of concurrence. The resulting strategy of containment, which sought equilibrium, not dominance, served the economic and security interests of both the United States and its allies. As a result, those allies tolerated and even endorsed American primacy. The United States was the unquestioned leader of the free world. As long as Washington did not mistake leadership as implying a grant of arbitrary authority, the United States remained first among equals. After 9-11, however, the Bush administration rejected mere equilibrium as a goal. 
rather than searching for a mutually agreeable point of concurrence, which implies a willingness to give and take, President Bush insisted on calling the shots. He demanded unquestioning conformity, famously declaring, you are either with us or against us. Niebuhr once observed that the wealth and power of the United States presented, quote, special temptations to vanity and arrogance which militate against our moral prestige and authority. In formulating their strategy for the so-called global war on terror, President Bush and his lieutenants succumbed to that temptation. The results have not been pretty. Hitherto reliable allies have become unreliable. Washington's capacity to lead has eroded. The moral standing of the United States has all but collapsed. In many parts of the world, American wealth and American power have come to seem intolerable. The Bush record represents the very inverse of what Niebuhr defined as successful statecraft. This is not to suggest that restoring realism and effectiveness to U.S. foreign policy is simply a matter of reviving the habits and routines to which Washington adhered from the late 1940s through the 1980s. The East-West dichotomies that defined that era have vanished, and the United States today is not the country it was in the days of Truman or Eisenhower. The difficult challenges facing the United States require us to go forward, not back. Yet here, too, Niebuhr, speaking to us from the days of Truman and Eisenhower, offers some suggestive insights on how best to proceed. By the time that the, that the irony of American history appeared in 1952, Niebuhr had evolved a profound appreciation for the domestic roots of U.S. foreign policy. He understood that the expansionist impulse central to the American diplomatic tradition derived in no small measure from a determination to manage the internal contradictions produced by the American way of life. From the very founding of the Republic, American political leaders had counted on the promise and the reality of ever greater material abundance to resolve or at least to alleviate those contradictions. As Niebuhr wrote, quote, we seek a solution for practically every problem of life in quantitative terms, convinced that more is better. It has long been, he went on to explain, the character of our particular democracy, founded on a vast continent, expanding as a culture with its expanding frontier and creating new frontiers of opportunity when the old geographic frontier ended, that every ethical and social problem of a just distribution of the privileges of life is solved by so enlarging the privileges that either an equitable distribution is made easier or a lack of equity is rendered less notable. No other community, he continued, had followed this technique of social adjustment more consistently than we, no other community, he said, had the resources to do so. Through a strategy of commercial and territorial expansion, the United States accrued power and fostered material abundance at home. Expectations of ever in increasing affluence, Niebuhr called it the American cult of prosperity, in turn ameliorated social tensions and with the notable exception of the Civil War, kept internal dissent within bounds, thereby permitting individual Americans to pursue their disparate notions of life, liberty, and happiness. Yet even in 1952, Niebuhr expressed doubts about this strategy's long-term viability, acknowledging that, quote, we have thus far sought to solve all our problems by the expansion of our economy. He went on to say that, quote, this expansion cannot go on forever. This brings us to the nub of the matter. Considering things strictly from the point of view of national self-interest and acknowledging various blunders made along the way, 
A strategy that relies on expansion abroad to facilitate the creation of a more perfect union at home has worked remarkably well. At least it did through the 1960s and the Vietnam War. Since that time, the positive correlation between expansion and prosperity, national power and individual freedom has begun to unravel. Since 2003 and the beginning of the Iraq War, it has become almost entirely undone. The ongoing US effort to, effort to transform the greater me Middle East is dissipating rather than enhancing American power. It is squandering rather than adding to our collective wealth. Rather than ensuring political freedom at home, it provides the Bush administration with pretexts to compromise our freedoms by distorting or annulling the Constitution. By no means least of all, that effort is exacting a huge moral price. I refer here not simply to the morally dubious policies devised to prosecute the global war on, global war on terror. At least as troubling is the moral dissonance generated by sending soldiers off to fight for freedom in distant lands when freedom at home appears increasingly to have become a synonym for, pro for profligacy, conspicuous consumption, and frivolous self-absorption. While US troops are engaged in Baghdad, Babylon, and Samara, place names redolent with ancient imperial connotations, their civilian counterparts back on the block preoccupy themselves with YouTube, reality TV, and the latest misadventures of Hollywood celebrities. Speaking for myself, although I hope in the spirit of Reinhold Niebuhr, this defines the essential crisis we face today. The basic precepts that inform US national security policy are not making us safer and more prosperous while guaranteeing authentic freedom. They have multiplied our enemies and put us on the road to ruin while indulging notions of freedom that are shallow and spurious. The imperative of the moment is to change fundamentally our approach to the world. Yet this is unlikely to occur absent a serious and self-critical examination of the domestic arrangements and priorities that define what we loosely refer to as the American way of life. No one sings odes to liberty as the final end of life with greater fervor than Americans, Niebuhr once observed. Yet it might also be said that no one shows less interest in discerning the true meaning of liberty than do Americans. Although I would not want to sell my countrymen short, the United States in the past has demonstrated a remarkable ability to weather crises and recover from adversity. I see little evidence today of interest in undertaking a critical assessment of our way of life, which would necessarily entail something akin to a sweeping cultural reformation. Certainly, President Bush will not promote such a self-assessment, nor will any of the leading candidates vying to succeed him. The political elite, the governing class, the Washington party, call it what you will, there is little likelihood of a great awakening starting from the top. We can only hope that before too many further catastrophes befall us, fortuitous circumstances will bring about what Niebuhr referred to as, quote, the ironic triumph of the wisdom of common sense over the foolishness of its wise men. End of quote. In the meantime, we should recall the warning with which Niebuhr concluded the irony of American history. Should the United States perish, the prophet wrote, the ruthlessness of the foe would be only the secondary cause of the disaster. The primary cause would be that the strength of a giant nation was directed by eyes too blind to see all the hazards of the struggle. And the blindness would be induced not by some accident of nature or history, but by hatred 
and vainglory. Change each would be in that quotation to was. And you have an inscription well suited for the memorial that will no, will no doubt be erected one day in Washington, honoring those who sacrificed their lives in Iraq. Thank you very much. Andy will take some questions, if there are some from the audience. There are two mics on either side. Or, or just editorial comments. You would even that, take them. That's possible, too. I was wondering if you could comment on the, uh, uh, if you have a sort of a general principle of when the use of uh, force by the United States is justified. I'm thinking specifically of uh, what your opinion on the use of force with respect to the Persian Gulf War, which I believe you were involved with, as well as uh, in Bosnia, Kosovo, and Afghanistan. That is, the use of force uh, other than the uh, Iraq situation over the last, uh, I guess, 25 years. Well, I'm, uh, I mean, I, I, I think as a matter, as a general rule, I would be uh, reluctant as a matter of policy to specifying one, two, three, six, nine criteria that somehow would be the gates that you'd have to pass through in order to uh, use force. But my general approach would be to advocate using force only as a last resort and only for matters of great consequence. Now, more than likely, the matters of great consequence would relate to specific interests to the United States and its allies. But there certainly one could anticipate situations where the matters of great consequence were moral. Beyond the question of when to use force, I think it's important to, it's important at the same time uh, to try to think your way through the consequences of using force. The older I get, and the more I try to understand history, the more I'm struck by the difficulty that statesmen and generals have of controlling war once it, once it has been unleashed, that uh, wars take on a life of their own. Wars almost invariably uh, take longer, cost more than the advocates of war have anticipated. And so without pretending that one could ever fully anticipate in advance what the consequences of going to war are likely to be, one should go into the war alive to the likelihood that the unattended consequences are likely to be profound. And therefore, one would try, I think, in, in a policy sense, to, uh, to hedge against what some of those consequences might be. Let me give you a specific example of what I mean. I think that the, the concept for, this is unrelated to your question, but I think the concept of a global war on terror is profoundly and fundamentally flawed as a response to 9-11. But nonetheless, the president, cheered on by the Congress, uh, committed the United States to a global war on terror that from the very outset we were told, this is quite apart from Iraq specifically, just the global war we were told was going to be an open-ended conflict likely to take decades if not generations. Well, that's a long time. Global's a big word. So one, one would have thought 
just based on the most casual reading of military history, that embarking upon an open-ended global war, then one of the things you might want to do to try to hedge against unanticipated uh, uh, consequences would be to expand the size of the, the US military. Matter of fact, in every major war in our history, with this single exception, that's what we have done. Whether it was a dumb war or a good war, 1812, 1846, 1861, 1898, 1917, 1941, 1950, 1965. You go to war, you make the army bigger. But this administration didn't do that. And so as it has found that its optimistic expectations of a clean, decisive, a clean, decisive encounters with the adversary have not come to pass, they find themselves without the additional resources that, if you believe in the enterprise, clearly would be helpful to sustaining it. This is one of my students, we have to be careful. <laughs> Actually, I'm not. <laughs> it's kind of far away. Um, it's kind of a similar question, but a little bit more broad in scope. Do you think that removing the pretense of a higher moral grounds would affect our ability as a country to be self-interested. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Okay, it's a good answer. No, no, give, um, give, 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 no. Just use some different words. Right. Um, by self-interested, I mean capable of of attending to matters that benefit us as a nation or that are important to our, on a basic level, security and on a larger level, way of life or a belief system. So do you think that if we were to eliminate this idea that democracy is a good thing, that it's a necessary thing, if we were to eliminate any sort of moral higher ground that would put where we stand as a nation above where any other nation might stand, okay. does that affect our ability to be self-interested? This, this is being recorded. I would like to go on the record as saying that I too think democracy is a good thing. But I believe that the integration of moral considerations in international politics is something that's ex exceedingly difficult. And this is because of the nature of politics. It is about the pursuit of power. And it's folly to expect that nations can act in ways that are counter to their very nature. So I would certainly urge that no president ever make a decision, an important decision relative to foreign policy, in which he was openly dismissive of moral considerations. On the contrary, I would want him to, or her, to act with a rather lively awareness of the moral implications of our actions. But we should never kid ourselves to think that when we act our, act, our actions are primarily motivated by our concerns for the well-being of others. I believe that that's simply not the case, except in perhaps the most, not, not trivial, but uh, peripheral sorts of, of uh, considerations, like a humanitarian res response to a humanitarian d disaster. So the key, I think, I think, I think it, it's very difficult for us to act in moral ways. It becomes even more difficult for us to act in moral ways if we, if we kid ourselves about who we are and about why we do what we do. Is that all right? I don't want to monopolize your time, but could I ask a follow-up question? Because you said a phrase that was really interesting. Uh, I believe, not to misquote you, but you said, the character of a nation or something of that nature, that a country has a sort of innate characteristic or quality. And I agree with a lot of what you said, but I wonder then, how does one change the character or quality of a nation? Well, as I was trying to suggest at the very end of the, uh, of the talk, that I think there's a practical matter that requires something like a great awakening, you know, a cultural, a cultural, I hate to use the word revolution, because that's not sort of where I come from politically, but. Uh, some sort of a significant cultural change 
uh, and that's not in the card. So I don't, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. When I decided to come up here, I was going to start at one place and talk about how I was stuck in a storm in Denver when the war started. And uh, I had left New York. It was um, St. Patrick's Day on the train. But really, when standing there, I decided that I would go back a little to um, a night I came from a history class I had here. I'm, I came to BU for a couple of years in the late um, 50s. And I was the first to go to college, and I had a very fine liberal arts education for two years, and then I moved to California. Anyway, I was taking a history of Boston um, class in an immigrant history class. And my degree actually is in history, American history. It's important for me, my parents were from Ireland, and I was first to go to college. So when I came back to BU, I was just auditing. It was after another attempt at grad school. I'd been a teacher, and I'm an artist. And I, was, um, I went from a class to watch one of the debates with uh, Bush and Kerry. And I was harassed by the Boston University police. And I'd had a very bad incident before that when I was coming from an art class at the BU bookstore. And I won't go into it, but by the time I got someone to pick me up in Denver to go out to where I was staying, I had waited in the bookstore near the train station, and it, I happened to look up as I was drinking my coffee, and I was in history of war section. And frankly, it had never occurred to me that I would study war, history of war, because I'm from the 60s and went on many marches and went to Quaker meeting when I was here at BU with a friend. Um, and as the oldest of seven with five brothers, I was not very popular. I had a brother who was in the army and in Vietnam. What, I'm, what, I, what I wanted to say was that in the end, everything seems to have an economic basis. It's about money. But if you were raised and you have a spiritual dimension to your life, you know there are spiritual laws. And that when you have the kind of thing, this appalling thing that's happened, and you have an idiot, God forgive me, but Bush, when you have something so appalling that I can't really go to the senior center without offending somebody whose grandson has been killed, when I say what I think about a, a, a police state that exists in this country, and I've been a victim of it. I was a teacher, and I say what I think. And I have had my life pretty much destroyed. But as an artist and a person who has a spiritual base, I don't give up. You know, I don't give up. Because I got a really good education here, and I believed in a lot of things. But what I say all the time is that what I never got was the, I didn't understand the fine art of hypocrisy. And my poor Irish mother, who was a lady, did her best. But I find myself, I think, um, I, I know I'll be rambling, and I don't want to do that, but as a teacher, having had brain-damaged kids, because mothers were using drugs, and on my way here tonight, I saw three cruises take two kids. I feel like what I learned about Afghanistan, what I know about the drugs in this country, have a whole lot to do with it, and the weapons. And people like myself, who take buses and are poor, are, are caught in these wars. And I, I have to paint sometimes, and I have to believe that there is a higher level to things, or I just couldn't stand it. Hello, and thank you for being here um, and doing this talk. I just, today actually, uh, myself and a number of fellow female law students were having a discussion about um, the nature of kind of the law and going into the legal profession and some of the uh, expectations on your personality and behavior and some of the things we don't like. And one of the things we were talking about was the illusion that if you are nice, you are weak. And, um, you know, I, this disturbs me on a prof personal and professional level, but I then, listening to you speak, was concerned on an international level what the implications of that broadly considered sentiment are. If you are nice, you are weak. And when you speak about humility and the need for humility, I agree with you entirely, and I agree with Niebuhr, um, who I was grateful to study at Harvard Divinity School, where they still care about such 
thinkers. And I, but I wonder what your opinion is as to how we change that um, kind of overarching ideology that humility equals weakness, and that if we um, that that the type of cultural awakening you're talking about, you know isn't some sort of lefty crazy conspiracy, but something meaningful and useful, because I am concerned that there are many people whose ears are closed to your message and as they were to Niebuhr's. Well, you said a lot there. Um, I'll, I'll try to focus on uh, are you not, uh, if, if, you're, if you're nice, are you weak? It was more actually, I guess, the idea of if you're humble or self-aware, are you weak, was kind of the follow-up. Well, oh, um, first of all, nice is not the issue. Uh, uh, I, mean, you know, it, I, I do think that there's something about the nature of international politics that uh, is unchangeable, and we're stuck with this <clears throat> world uh, of nation states, uh, and it's a, it's a competitive world. So it's not a question of nice. I think it is a question of, of straightforward. <laughs> Uh, being straightforward and being uh, clear uh, and trying to uh, communicate clearly to other nations uh, how one defines one in one's interests of identifying where there are common interests, where we can work together with others and where there may be differences. But differences doesn't necessarily mean that that has to necessarily lead to lead to war, but it's, it's not quite a niceness issue. I don't think that quite captures it. Over on this side. Yeah. Uh, a few weeks ago, the president was at the UN and uh, told the world that Americans were um, outraged, I think was the word, by the situation in Burma. And I'm wondering, uh, in light of what you said and in light of the sort of the myth and reality of the American liberation story, what should our attitude be towards tyranny in the world such as in Burma? Well, we should condemn tyranny in the world. And there may be occasions where tyrants are so brutal and where human rights are violated on such a massive scale that we should act forcibly to put an end to that sort of behavior. But we should do so, again, with our eyes wide open without expecting that somehow if we were to intervene in Burma that we could transform Burma into some kind of a liberal a democracy. I read the op-ed, I think it was in yesterday's Washington Post, maybe it was Sunday's, by William Crystal, who is always keen to, uh, he's the editor of the Weekly Standard, he's a leading neoconservative, he's always keen to uh, intervene on behalf of the world's oppressed, and he was making the case that we need to do more for the people of Burma. I sympathize with the people of Burma. But I also sympathize with the people in our own country uh, who live very difficult lives, who don't have opportunity, who don't have a chance to get a decent education, who can't afford health care. And so if one wants to mobilize state power on behalf of people who are deprived, why would one not begin with the mobilization of state power on the behalf of our own people, given that the preamble of the Constitution, which supposedly is the basic law of the land, says that the purpose of the compact is to, is to act on the behalf of the American people, not primarily on the behalf of everybody else in the world. Once we get the United States sorted out, uh, then perhaps we could sort of move on to other enterprises, but it seems to me that there are, are that the people of our own country actually have the first claim on anything that the state has to offer. One last question. Hi, I think this was an issue that was maybe tiptoed around by the other questions in front of me, which is that in the case of politics, it's easy to make solutions that are very, uh, I guess, general and abstract and sort of sweeping ideas but it's easy to lose sight of the fact that you need specific policies to actually change things. So I was wondering if you had any specific things that you supported in terms of pointing things in the direction uh, that you were advocating. Well, <clears throat> I tried to make the point early on that uh, you don't read Niebuhr so you can get the, uh, you know, the, the, the six steps to get you out of the Iraq war. But if you're asking me, do I, rather than Niebuhr, have a plan, the answer is yes. 
I only got about two minutes, and I have to, I gave a 40-minute talk at Amherst on Thursday night. It was a talk. It was not a lecture. And so I'm going to try to compress that, that 40-minute talk, into two minutes. We won't be able to determine the future of Iraq. There may not even be an Iraq. It may be a fiction, which we can thank the Brits for. The war is militarily unwinnable. We need to extricate our combat troops with all due speed. That's not cut and run. That's call General Petraeus on the phone, tell him his mission's changed, ask him for a plan about how he's going to withdraw. To the extent that there may be some smidgen of hope that the Iraqi government is going to get its act together, I personally have my doubts, but to the extent that there's some smidgen of hope, then it would make sense to leave behind a force with a train and equip mission as opposed to a combat mission. Once it becomes evident that that smidgen of hope no longer exists, then we should completely cut our losses and remove all support and all participation in that country. Now, there will be those who, who would say, oh my gosh, my golly, don't we have a moral obligation to the Iraqis? And the answer to that question is, A, we have no moral obligation to the Iraqi government. We have a massive moral obligation to the Iraqi people. But the way to meet that moral obligation is not to continue with the war that has visited upon them such misery. It rather is to divert some of the resources we are using for the war in order to alleviate their suffering. There are something on the order of two and a half million Iraqi refugees that are in Jordan and Syria and other places. I don't know how much it costs to maintain two and a half million people on a daily basis, but I dare say we could take some of the four billion dollars a week that we are spending on the Iraq war and divert it to that purpose. Or, this is, this is my favorite idea because it gets all the anti-immigrant people squirming. Uh, if we have a moral obligation to the Iraqi people, then let us offer them sanctuary. Let them come to the land of the free. I don't know how many Iraqis would take us up on that offer. Half million, million, two million. It's a big country. We've got a, we've got a tradition of welcoming immigrants. And that would go far, I think, towards discharging our moral obligation. That's what we should do about Iraq. Now, what should we do about the threat of global, excuse me, of violent Islamic radicalism, which is real? It is real. Well, we should rethink this whole notion of a war which is intended to prevent another 9-11. We should rather recognize that we got two problems. The one problem is Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, the people who are actually engaged in using violence against us and our interests. And there, frankly, we have no choice but to go find them and kill them. But that's not a task for the 82nd Airborne Division or for F-16 fighter planes. It's actually a task primarily for intelligence agencies, police forces, assisted by special operations forces. So let's take another chunk of that $4 billion a week that we're wasting and let's reprogram it in order to refocus our intelligence effort on the people who are actually trying to kill us. Finally, there's the question of the Islamic world. These 1.4 billion people. I have, a, I have a crazy friend in Canada who I don't know who this guy is. He sends me long emails. <laughs> he, has, he has read half the books ever published, I'm convinced. And one of the things that he has told me in these long emails is, and I think it's the beginning, it's the beginning of wisdom, we must let Islam be Islam. Islam is following some historical trajectory of change. And the people of the Muslim world who are devoted to Islam, ultimately will decide 
where they are going. It is as preposterous for us to claim that somehow we are going to redirect or shape the Islamic world as it would be for Osama bin Laden to say that he is going to redirect Christianity along some path. Christianity has changed radically over time. Christianity will continue to change. Christianity has some kind of historic destination. Let the Islamic world figure out where it's going to go. In the meantime, we want to make sure we try to insulate ourselves from any spillover that may not be friendly to us, which implies the need to devise a strategy of containment that is not like the strategy of containment we devised during the Cold War, but has the same effects. In my last point, when we think about the strategy of containment during the Cold War, of course, it wasn't simply about containment. It wasn't simply about trying to hold in place the threat of Soviet communism. On the margins, on the fringes, it also saw an effort to nudge that part of the world in a certain direction. Never more than on the margins to try to encourage change within the, within the Soviet bloc that actually might lead to the Soviet bloc either becoming more benign or ultimately failing. Never more than on the margins. But the, the strategy of containment has both a negative aspect, but also a positive aspect. We need to think through what the strategy of containment ought to be, and that's the alternative to the global war on terror. Thank you very much. We had an incredibly rare evening. We heard both a lecture and a talk. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as a memento of this evening, I have two things. One is this plaque oh, thank with you the poster. Thank you. And second is another memento that you can oh, give to wow. your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.